All right, hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining this second Action Against Stunting Day. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'm just here to give you some, some housekeeping information. For those of you who are here in person, we have exit and, uh, exit, uh, emergency exits in the back and in the front. Uh, toilets are one or two floor down, so you can go there um, if you need to. Uh, after the presentations, we will have a photo exhibition downstairs where there will also be uh, lunch, so some nibbles and sandwiches are here. Um, in addition to that, there will be some um, uh, school resources that um, uh, Rachel Mason here at Science Made Symbol has made. Uh, she started uh, working on this uh, last year for the first Action Against Stunting Day uh, when schools were in lockdown and a lot of remote teaching. Um, but now she's expanded on that. So uh, we're very excited about that. So uh, I will put some uh, links to these materials in the chat uh, and also on Twitter. Uh, if you have any questions, then uh, we have uh, we will ask you to ask these on Twitter. So those of you who are here in person today, you'll see the um, where to tweet your questions up on the screen here, and I will put it in the chat for everyone who's joining online. Um, I think that was it for me. So okay. yeah, thanks, okay, thanks, Claire. All right. Um, thanks very much. Um, my name is Claire Hatford, and I'm the director of LIDC and the PI of the Action Against Stunting Hub. And it is you know, wonderful to have this in-person event and to welcome everyone from our watch parties around the world. And we were lucky enough to have uh, Professor Liam Smith open our event today. And for those of you around the world who don't know Liam, he is a professor of clinical epidemiology and the director of the London School. He is also a clinician in NHS general practice. He's a previous trustee of the British Heart Foundation and a non-executive director of Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. He's also a member of the Strategic Oversight Committee for UK Biobank and an elected fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Uh, welcome, Professor Smith. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, thank I think I'm on. Thank you, Claire. Um, I don't know, I'm getting a video, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, so a word of welcome. Uh, both for those of you in person and those online from me. Uh, as Claire says, I'm uh, Liam Smith, director of the school. And the school's mission is very much to try and contribute to health worldwide through research and teaching and education and really trying to focus on the major challenges facing the world. Um, yeah, you don't need me to tell you 150 million children stunted and we know the immediate main cause is inadequate nutrition. What matters, of course, is the causes of the cause. And there, there is enormous complexity and the, the solutions we multifaceted, hugely challenging. And we know that to make progress in this kind of complex, important area, people are gonna to need to work together in partnership. And I think it's up to all of us to try and ensure those partnerships are equitable and based on trust and mutual respect. And, I think a truly trusting, respectful partnership is one that delivers more than people would by working on their own. And certainly one of the major problems facing the world of stunting is going to need people to work together. I think, I don't know if the days ever did exist of individual scientists working alone to solve everything, but I think increasingly in this complex world, we're gonna see people needing to come together, to work together to try and tackle the major health problems. And so it is great to see this initiative and great to see this day going ahead to do exactly that. Um, I know the focus is on a just transition to sustainable food systems and food security. And that is, it just sounds like such an exciting time and such an important challenge. And I think sustainable here has two meanings. One is that, that it can be perpetuated and something that isn't just a quick fix that then goes away again and everything goes wrong again. But it's also about that fitting that with a more sustainable planet, and that's what we need to do. So clearly we need to be able to feed everyone, but feed everyone in a way that is sustainable in the long term, including for the planet. So uh, hugely important challenges for you ahead. Uh, no pressure, but the world needs uh, you and your work to come together try and make progress on this crucial area. And I wish you all good luck, enjoy today, and really good luck in the future too. And uh, thank you again for attending. Okay, bye-bye.
you know, we often in global development bandy these numbers about, you know, we, 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 but if we, to put this in context, you know, there's 2.2 stunted children for every man, woman, and child that resides in the UK. 149 children is nearly half the population of America. So they could all live from sort of, you know, from the Missouri River to the East Coast. It's a phenomenal amount of children who will never reach their potential. And it's completely unacceptable. So, over the years, a number of groups have attempted to look at the costs involved. And I'm really pleased that Sandy's here because I'm gonna present on some global panel. Um, and we're really lucky that our LIDC partners undertook the study in 2016. And what they found was the cost of malnutrition was astronomical, 3.6 around trillion dollars annually, where obesity, and these were the figures from 2010, cost about 1.4 trillion. So already you can see that there's a big gap um, between what's happening with obesity. And we, we expect that the obesity figures would, would be increasing. So one of the things, but obviously that's half of the problem. Here's what it costs us. But what's the solution? What are we investing in this? And again, this isn't a study done by the World Bank before the pandemic. So nutritional programs, um, we're investing about 3.6 billion annually. This was in 2017. The investment gap in 2017 to meet SDG2 was 70 billion over, over 10 years. Now it's not all doom and gloom. The Nutrition for Growth Summit, there were pledges about 27 billion. So, now, I think everybody recognizes that with this sort of historical level of investment, that meeting the SDG twos and really fundamentally changing what's happening for stunted children on the ground would, would be problematic. Um, but I think that the second issue that these global panel figures raise this really relates to this fluctuating gap between global levels of malnutrition and global levels of obesity. And this brings us to the nutrition transition. So now the nutrition transition is not a new thing. It's, it's quite old thing. It's been around since the 1990s. Um, there was uh, an American academic named Barry Popkin who referred to this global trend that, well, of of as countries got wealthier, they moved from traditional diets to more of the westernized diets, high fat, high carbohydrate, ultra processed food. So the great irony is that wealth, while improving many indicators of, of well being and health, has a really negative impact on diets. And his work really, I think, laid a lot of the groundwork for understanding the phenomenon of the double burden of malnutrition, which our speakers are going to take us through today. So the theme of our Action Against Stunting Day is, is nutrition transition, but here we're not talking about nutrition transition in the historical sense. We're really talking about how do we move this space forward and fundamentally tackle the double burden of malnutrition. And for many people, this relates to transforming food systems. So I put radical in parentheses because it'll be really interesting to see how our speakers talk about this today. And I think the goal here is not to turn back the clock, but to, but to really address some of these inequities in global food systems, to understand them, unpack them, and then address them. So we have a range of experts that have come today to take us through, uh, oh, oh, sorry, a little bit stuck. Yeah, to take us through these issues. Um, and of course, there's a big shout out to the Country Hub teams. Uh, we have a wide range of activities taking place on Action Against Stunting Day, from community level caravans in, in Senegal to uh, media outreach in, in, in 
in Indonesia. We've got billboards going up in, in Nin at Hyderabad. And uh, we've got a poster competition for students in Gujarat. And I'd like to have a special mention of the students who I know are watching us um, from the watch party today. Uh, these are you know, really wonderful posters. And then of course, we've got our Science Made Simple public engagement partners. And Rachel, you might want to speak a little bit about the material you've developed. From here? Yep. Okay. Yep. Hello, everybody. My name is Rachel. I work for Science Made Simple. We are a public engagement partner on the hub. And we have been working in the background, learning from the scientists um, all about all of the messages that the hub might want to convey to um, people beyond those who are directly involved in the hub. So for us, that's been schools in the UK, perhaps communities in the different countries we've been working in, and uh, amongst other sort of uh, undergraduate, PhD, postdoc researchers who are interested in the subject. So if you would like to come and have a play downstairs a bit later with some of the things we've been experimenting with, we would love to experiment with you a little later. So please come and see us downstairs later. Okay, thank you, Rachel. All right, so I guess we can move on to our first session, which is really about setting the scene and our first speaker. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Luz Maria de Reggio, who currently heads the unit of multi-sectoral actions and food systems at WHO. Her work focuses on food safety, obesity, as well as food-based approaches to improving nutrition. Luz Maria is a food scientist and epidemiologist, and her expertise spans from micronutrient malnutrition to the double burden of malnutrition, from research in nutrition science to large-scale public health programming and policy. So a very hearty welcome to Dr. Luz Maria de Regal. So the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. And can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yes. And the last thing, uh, are you going to turn on the camera or not? Yes, do. do. Or you want me to do that? Could you please turn on your camera? Okay, I'm here. So good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here this morning with you. Uh, I will talk about double duty action against malnutrition. I it re really the uh, point is to talk about what was discussed before, immediately before. We are facing a nutritional transition, and the action that we can that we are having now cannot go only in one direction. Um, the recent uh, state of food insecurity report, I mean, confirms what we have seen uh, for many years. The first is that the stunting is showing a declining uh, trend, but obesity in children is a little bit flat, but overweight and obesity in adults is going up. Uh, that is happening in most of the settings. Stunting is more prevalent in low-income countries, while obesity and overweight are more prevalent in a high and middle-income uh, middle-income and high-income countries. However, it is there is a huge overlap because the prevalence of stunting is so high, the prevalence of micronutrient deficiencies are so high, the prevalence of obesity are so high that uh, just common sense allows to think that there is a huge overlap of these conditions in the same individual, not only at the country level, but in the same individual. However, we, uh, we have a, a, some limitation in the data to see whether uh, this coexisting form of malnutrition are affecting uh, indeed large amounts of people. So coexisting forms of malnutrition is not a new term. Uh, some people are, are calling it individual double burden of malnutrition, etc. But basically it refers to the presence of more than one type of malnutrition in an individual. In general, we talk about population levels, but again, uh, uh, here we need to think about a little bit of management at the individual level, prevention at the community level. Uh, the Global Nutrition Report 2022 shows that uh, 124 countries experience a high level of at least two types of malnutrition, uh, either stunting and vitamin and mineral deficiencies or um, other, other conditions. 
41 countries experienced high levels of all three forms of malnutrition. Uh, this is where we start at the individual level. The most uh, recent estimates that we have, although they may by, may by far underestimate the problem. Uh, almost 16 million children are affected uh, by wasting and stunting. And if you're coming from the nutrition side, that can make sense. I mean, you see uh, they are related to food insufficiency, either acute or a uh, chronic, but they are talking about more uh, the same problem. However, if you see the next bullet point, 8.23 million or 8 million children are affected by stunting and overweight. Uh, that's on average uh, prevalent, the global prevalence is 1.9%, 1.87%, but ranges between the countries from 8 to 18%. And if you see the map that is on the right, uh, you will see that some countries are starting to analyze in their national surveys the coexistence of these conditions. But if you see, really is the minimum number of countries. So that's what I was saying that the estimates are completely underestimated. Uh, and thus the actions to address them simultaneously are um, um, not really taking this uh, approach. Uh, one date, uh, additional information is that indeed uh, in, a, in Indian analysis of uh, stunted children show that uh, 50% may have uh, indicators of dyslipidemia or dysglycemia, which shows that uh, children are stunted, but also really exposed to uh, foods that are not healthy or uh, behaviors, uh, eating behaviors that are not healthy. Uh, these coexisting forms of malnutrition are complex, uh, challenging to control. And of course, the more conditions an individual has, uh, the more, um, the, most, uh, the, the higher is the risk for diseases and mortality. And it's more difficult to manage them and prevent them simultaneously. Stunting and obesity and uh, on overweight share a common determinant. Last year, WHO published this uh, impact pathways of food systems. It's a packet slide, so you have the reference there. Uh, but basically what we are identifying are five pathways through which uh, food systems can affect uh, health outcomes, including stunting, overweight, uh, non-communicable diseases, etc. And if you take a minute to look at uh, wasting, uh, sorry, stunting and obesity, they have common determinants. They, a uh, common determinant could be diet, diet, chemical contamination, uh, hunger and food insecurity. So we know that, uh, that they have common drivers. The difficult part is that data still don't know to which extent uh, those drivers are highly prevalent or not and how they are affecting individuals and populations. So if you look at the references, you can see that now more studies are looking not only at the prevalence, but also at the determinants to be able to address um, the, problem the problems simultaneously in particular settings. The important part of the previous slide is that the thinking needs to change. Is thinking about the stunting is critical, but now as public health pro uh, professionals, we need to think more about how we can do more because those children, stunted children are gonna be uh, likely have overweight or obesity. And there is a clear trend uh, related to age, for example, uh, the older the child is, the more likely is to have uh, some overweight or obesity. And of course, if there are in uh, food insecure environments, those conditions, both the risk of both conditions increases. So as I was saying, we need to start thinking about double the reactions to address uh, malnutrition. Uh, they address both undernutrition and, and uh, as macro or micronutrient deficiencies or problems of overweight, obesity, and diet related NCDs. And they are based, the rationale is that uh, all forms of malnutrition share common drivers that can be, can be leveraged for double impact. These drivers include nutrition in early life, diet diversity, food environment, and socioeconomic factors. Uh, WHO's uh, website has this brief if you want to look at it, but I wanted to bring to your attention this slide. Uh, there are common drivers of these two conditions. But importantly, there are solutions because there are shared platforms that can be leveraged, social protection, uh, 
food guidelines, national programs, etc. And there are conditions that can be addressed uh, simultaneously or interventions. Breastfeeding is a clear example of a double reaction that can, uh, if established properly and maintained for a sufficient time, uh, can prevent uh, stunting or can help prevent the stunting. But at the same time, there is more and more evidence that breastfeeding can prevent also uh, the onset of overweight and obesity in children. Uh, marketing regulations, of course, they, they are focused mostly on the prevention of obesity. But uh, if you think a little bit more, uh, the access, I mean, uh, the, if you prevent the marketing of harmful products to children, it's more likely that then we are promoting foods that are healthier uh, for, for them and that in turn can prevent uh, stunting. So there are multiple platforms and of course they share outcomes of both conditions in terms of well-being and, uh, and physical health and, and of course prevention of disease and mortality. So WHO in the area of the food systems has a recently or last year published a menu of our action for preventing diet related NCDs or diet related, um, but those are WHO actions if you think a little bit more uh, of them more carefully. Let me see if I can. The first action is reformulation of foods to ensure that they are uh, have less salt, they have less sugar, they have a uh, no almost a uh, less amounts of unhealthy fats or elimination of trans fatty acids. Uh, the second intervention is taxing of unhealthy options and incentivizing the production of healthy options that can reach children uh, and vulnerable populations. The third option, which is uh, the one in, in yellow, is a establishment of a healthy procurement of services, uh, of foods in services provided by the government. Uh, schools, cafeterias, hospital uh, cafeterias, etc., can benefit from better policies of in the procurement of food. The power of the food that the government uh, procures is huge and often can reach vulnerable populations. So the one of the key uh, pace, uh, steps to get started is to modify the procurement of uh, procurement policies at government level. Labeling is the other action. Uh, we need clear labels that can uh, provide information on the amounts of nutrients that are uh, macronutrients, micronutrients, and, all, um, and all, the, all the ingredients that labels have. But more importantly, they need to be understood and understandable uh, by, uh, for everyone. The fifth action is a food fortification. Food fortification aims at increasing the amount of vitamin and minerals in staple foods, but uh, the current uh, discourse is that probably not all foods need to be fortified. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of the questions that we receive is whether sugar should be fortified. Uh, some countries have policies for that. And of course, uh, that is a very, uh, although sugar can reach many people, from the NCD's perspective, it raises a lot of questions on whether we should promote the fortification of sugar, or rather uh, we should promote uh, the fortification of other food vehicles. So now uh, the double, this conversation of uh, non-communicable diseases and prevention of vitamin and mineral deficiencies and stunting, now is getting a multi-faceted approach in terms of prevention of multiple conditions. And the last, um, the last um, intervention that I was uh, mentioning is prevention of marketing of unhealthy foods to children, um, including breast milk substitutes, for example, which is a critical one. I, I didn't want to forget about food safety because food safety underpins all those food systems actions. If we cannot ensure that the food is safe, the benefit uh, is gonna be less. So we need to make sure that always uh, we do not promote a reformulation without thinking about the possible effects on food sa uh, safety, but also that we fix the supply chain to ensure that uh, there are no uh, contamin contaminants for contamination that can preclude uh, growth, for example. Uh, one of the cases that comes to my mind in this moment is aflatoxins, for example, uh, that comes in the supply chain and research, uh, recent research is linking it to stunting, for example. So food safety cannot be ignored in all these interventions through the food safe, uh, systems. I know that my time is running out, so I wanted to share, I, I hope that I have made my case that the time is now to start thinking really more holistically. Uh, stunting uh, has a clear drivers, is making progress, but this is the time 
to start thinking also about uh, using all those interventions and platforms to prevent overweight and obesity uh, since childhood. WHO has uh, published recently uh, briefs on all the actions that I uh, showed in the previous slide. Uh, they have country uh, cases, so we can get more inspiration on how these interventions can be used. Importantly, all these interventions are already monitored by global systems. They are endorsed by different re resolutions. There is experience in multiple countries, and what we are trying to do is to bring them together to make sure that they, uh, sure that they are implementable. And there is one recent brief, for example, in, in salt iodization and sodium intake that really takes this uh, double burden, uh, double duty action scope or approach, because uh, that's an intervention uh, that often sits at different levels in the government or different sectors of the government. However, the the, the vehicle the, is the same. The platform is salt. And we need to ensure that the sodium reduction strategies are aligned with the fortification uh, extra, uh, strategies. So the thinking in terms of funding, planning, programming, monitoring, measuring, surveillance, etc., needs to be joined. It needs to happen jointly if we really want to address the problems uh, simultaneously. Otherwise, we fix a problem in one area and we create a problem in other areas or might create a problem in other areas. If you want to learn more about these interventions, please go to our website, uh, Food Systems for Health, that's an initiative, or the WHO Nutrition website. Uh, you will find all the resources regularly. Or, of course, uh, you can connect. I, I, uh, there's my uh, link on LinkedIn, or you can write me an email, and I'm happy to share these resources with you uh, or answer any questions. So I will stop here and hand over the microphone to you, Claire. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really interesting and a very practical kind of way forward. Thank you for that. And I hope you're going to stay for the for the panel discussion because I think there'll be more questions that come out. Yeah. So our second speaker is uh, Dr. Patricia Fricassi. She's a senior nutrition and food systems officer at FAO. Uh, she leads work on governance policies, programs, and investments. Previously, she was a senior analyst at the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement Secretariat, where she focused on multi-sectoral approaches uh, to implementing and tackling, tracking nutritional investments. She's also worked for UNICEF and the World Bank. And prior to this, she was uh, Oxfam Italia's country director in Vietnam. Patricia, a very hearty welcome to Action Against Stunting Day. Thank you so much, and um, I hope you can see my presentation and hear me well. And yes. I'm, thank you. So I'm um, I'm very happy to to do this uh, presentation, and uh, it's a nice segue from the presentation of uh, Luz. I'm going to talk about uh, a food system approach for the prevention of stunting in the context of food crisis and uh, climate change. Uh, with a focus on uh, low-income countries uh, facing uh, acute food insecurity and high burden of malnutrition. So why do we want a food system approach? Uh, um, the importance of the healthy diets has been already mentioned. So poor diets are uh, con contributing to child stunting and other forms of malnutrition, including considering the, the gut micro, microbiome. Policy making and the program design is constrained by insufficient understanding about the drivers of supply and demand of safe and nutritious food in different contexts. So a food system approach can help to identify entry points from the ecosystems that support food production all the way to the consumption, as well as they can help to identify potential trade-offs, which is something very important when different sector and discipline come together. Patricia, many many apologies. Could you please make your presentation full screen? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, because I have several. Uh, is it now full screen? 
Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Sorry, because I have several screens, so I couldn't see. No problem. Thank you. Okay, in terms of the scale of the program, problem, uh, humankind faces a perfect storm of climate change, biodiversity loss, and multiple forms of malnutrition. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation impact the food availability, as well as the quality of the food. And also the stability through the re reduction of uh, genetic variation to breed crops that with withstand climate change. According to the SOFI 2022, 3.1 billion of people were unable to afford healthy diets in 2020, with an increase of 112 million compared with 2019, reflecting the inflation in food prices and the reduction of income stemming from COVID-19. Um, COVID and this estimate does not account for the impact of the food crisis. While progress has been made uh, towards the 2030 global uh, child stunting target, low-income economies in Africa and in Asia concentrate about 94% of all stunted children. Challenges in terms of climate change, biodiversity and malnutrition are well known. But it seems that what is missing is uh, in policy making and in program design is a recognition that food is at the center of all three issues. And therefore, it needs to be uh, repositioned in terms of availability, accessibility and affordability of a variety of safe and nutritious food as central to healthy diets. And furthermore, we need to consider uh, the special nutrition needs of population groups, such as young children, pregnant and, and breastfeeding women, as well as the elderly. So around 2.3 billion people lacked access to adequate food in 2021. And we know that consumption expenditure um, by household show that the poorest are the hardest hit by food price increase because they spend more than half of their income in the purchase of food. Especially in low in income countries, around 25% of the income goes for the purchase of staple food and more than half of the income for the purchase of unprocessed non-staple foods, such as fruits and vegetable and animal source foods. And they, we know that uh, recent systematic review and meta-analysis uh, reports an increase in consumption of cheap, nutrient-poor foods that are high in added sugar and fat. And this is happening across the globe, including in low-income countries. Three crops, wheat, rice, and maize, provide 40% of the global dietary energy supply. So while low-income countries rely mostly on uh, or heavily on locally produced staple foods, there are 36 countries in the world, including low-income countries and middle-income countries, that rely for more than half of their supply on the import of wheat from Russia and Ukraine. These net importers have been heavily affected by the current um, war in, uh, in Ukraine. But what is also um, important to understand is that uh, three quarters of the people in acute food insecurity live in conflict affected countries and are also affected by climate change. So a reduction in productivity has been seen over the past years. So it's not something that is 
uh, really coming from this recent uh, crisis that has been accelerated by the war in uh, Ukraine. So looking at the production income and trade triangle in different settings should help to better understand the drivers in terms of availability, accessibility, and affordability of healthy diets, as well as the consumption, considering both the supply producer and the demand consumer side in, when we are doing policy making and program design. So in our theory of change, we are looking at the application of a food system perspective. As I mentioned, from the ecosystem supporting food production to the actual pro, uh, production, processing, distribution, preparation, consumption, and disposal of food. Our proposed theory of change considers biodiversity and healthy diets as the two key levers to improve nutrition outcomes and optimize environmental sustainability in the context of climate change adaptation and mitigation. This theory of change also recognizes the importance of agri-food systems that are inclusive of the most vulnerable people and that should be resilient to the shock and stresses from climate change. The recognition of determinants of food choices driven by accessibility and affordability is crucial to understand patterns of supply and demand of safe and nutritious food in low-income communities. It also acknowledges that in those settings, healthy diets might be a matter of prioritization by policy makers in terms of policy and investment and not an entire responsibility of the households. So when looking at entry points for transformative actions in agri-food system, we have highlighted those that can improve biodiversity, so that have an environmental um, impact uh, into account, as well as healthy diets in the context of climate change. Some of the entry points uh, that pertain to food environment and consumer behavior will be discussed in more detail by my colleagues. Here, I really uh, wanted to uh, look at the uh, supply side and how this influences accessibility and affordability to healthy diets. I had prepared two examples, but I think that in the interest of time, uh, unless told otherwise, I will focus only on one example. And it is really uh, one example uh, to show um, how the food system perspective can be applied so that we really look at this, um, the consideration in terms of dietary outcome, but also the environmental and socio-economic uh, outcome. So in the first example, uh, we are considering uh, the action of enriching the nutrient content of staple food. Here, the context is low-income rural settings uh, with high prevalence and burden of child undernutrition, including micronutrient deficiencies. Currently, uh, nutrient and rich crops uh, re um, reach over 64 million consumers across country, especially in Asia and in Africa. So the aim in this case, uh, in this example, is to look at actions that promote nutrient and rich crops, also known as biofortified crops, with a focus on commonly consumed staples to address dietary deficiencies among low-income rural populations. And we also look at this particular example in the context of the African Development Bank 
uh, 1.5 billion emergency food production facility as a, an illustration of a substantial response to the current food crisis. So this facility is currently focusing at boosting the productivity of wheat, maize, rice, and soya bean. In this case, the shift we want to, be, to see that has also a nutrition value is to go beyond uh, productivity. So to really see how this investment, which will take place in priority countries in Africa, can maximize the nutrition gains. So the enriching of the nutrient content of staple food is based on the selection of local varieties that are resistant to climate change. It also includes agriculture practices such as improved soil management, and there is um, an increasing uh, body of evidence that shows the importance of considering the, um, the healthiness of soil uh, for nutrition, as well as water management and conventional breeding technologies. The focus is clearly on the nutrition value of what is produced. And it's fundamental to respond to current needs for, uh, um, for healthy diets, as well as to prevent environmental degradation of land and natural resources. Uh, we know that poorer yields, especially in low-income countries, are commonly addressed by applying more fertilizers. And this is often subsidized with uh, fiscal incentives which has implication of, for the environment and the human health. Uh, Luz before has already mentioned the importance of looking at food safety and applying a One Health approach when it comes to looking across the food system. In low-income countries where uh, staple food constitutes a large part of the diet, the change to nutrient and rich staples can contribute to improve the quality of the diet, primarily for producer households. But it can also be um, included in public procurement, which would benefit low-income households as well as school children, especially through the inclusion uh, in school meals. And nutrition education, and this is something very important, should still focus on promoting nutrient-enriched staple food as part of a diversified healthy diet, so not as a substitution for a healthy diet. In the long term, we have seen that countries are shifting towards market-based approach that look into the tra traceability of nutrient enriched crops and products and look at the increasing consumer awareness on their value, including the uh, more complex um, part that relates to the milling and the importance of not uh, milling away the nutritional content in crops. So here, going back to the African Development Bank 1.5 billion for the emergency food production facility, we have seen that uh, if the emphasis is only on the productivity side, we are going to lose an opportunity for instead looking at how to maximize the nutritional value of this investment. In this example, I have looked at nutrient enriched um, staple food through crop improvement as the entry point. But we have seen that this also triggers consideration and actions across the entire food system, from the ecosystem to the food environment to the all the way to the consumer behaviors. So I'm not going to have the time to go through the second example, which was on the animal source food, 
because I see that also a colleague is uh, uh, going to cover it. But I would like to uh, conclude with an open question uh, to you as student, researcher, practitioner, to ask if this approach, uh, not necessarily the example, if the approach resonates with your area of work and research. Thank you so much for the consideration. Patricia, thank you for that. That was a really useful oversight. Thank you. So our third speaker for this um, session is Dr. Bharati Kulkarni. She is the country lead um, for India for the UK RI Action Against Stunting Hub. Uh, but she also heads the Division of Reproductive Biology, Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition at the Indian Council of Medical Research in New Delhi. Her research interests lie in the management of severe, severe acute malnutrition, um, maternal nutrition and health, agricultural nutrition linkages, and interventions to improve the nutritional status of women and children. Welcome, Bharati. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone from wherever you are joining. Uh, very warm greetings from Action Against Stunting Hub India. And I would be uh, uh, speaking on the same, almost similar topic as the previous speakers, and they have made my job very easy. Thank you so much. So as we are aware, India is facing double burden of malnutrition. This comprehensive national nutrition survey data shows that uh, almost more than a third of children are stunted. At the same time, prevalence of obesity in overweight and obesity in adolescents, it's uh, rising. Uh, it's very worrisome that the prevalence of pre-diabetic status as well as hypertension in adolescents is rising quite rapidly. For example, many states in India showed that uh, more than 20% adolescents had pre-diabetic status based on their fasting plasma glucose. And uh, states such as a very large state of Uttar Pradesh had more than 8% adolescents who, were, uh, who had hypertension. Uh, and I, I think this is uh, known for quite some, uh, for a few decades now that uh, the regions where the prevalence of undernutrition is higher, uh, prevalence of diabetes is also higher. And we are accustomed to see the world as a map in, in, in the uh, upper panel, but the lower uh, panel show uh, the map of the countries uh, where their sizes are shown in proportion uh, to the problem. And when we see that undernutrition in children uh, high in India, at the same time, uh, there is higher prevalence of diabetes also. Uh, we all are aware of developmental origins of health and disease uh, theory, which states by Professor David Barker, which states that undernutrition in early life predisposes to later uh, non-communicable diseases. And it is especially true in case of children who have uh, rapid growth. For example, this study from Pune shows that children who had the lowest birth weight and uh, uh, had higher body mass index in the adulthood had the highest risk of diabetes. Uh, the, the other cohorts in New Delhi as well as Vellore also show that the, the dotted line is the cohort, uh, overall cohort, and the lines which are uh, the centiles show that children who were undernourished as compared to the other cohort members, but grew up rapidly in terms of their body mass index had a higher risk of impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes in adulthood. So this is linked with uh, a peculiar body composition of Indians as well as other South Asians, uh, men, uh, not only South Asians, other Asians, and many studies have been published uh, which show that Asians tend to have higher fat mass for a given body mass index. So it is the adiposity basically, which increases the risk of non-communicable diseases. And this study from National Institute of Nutrition, which included women who were involved in manual occupations, uh, had 
a very high body fat percent of 33%, although they did not have high prevalence of overweight or obesity. And the receiver operating characteristics in the study showed that if we have to predict uh, body fat percent based on body mass index, uh, body fat percent of 30% was seen at a BMI of 20 and body fat percent of 35% was seen at BMI of 22%. So we cannot tell these women to lose further weight in order to reduce the risk of obesity because uh, that would lead to, uh, that would result in BMI reaching below 18.5, which itself is associated with different kinds of risk. Uh, what we see in this population is the relationship between body mass index and body fat percent is very steep. And therefore, what we need is to reduce the slope of this relationship which means that the body fat should be replaced by muscle mass. And it is linked with the childhood growth. And that's the linking factor, I believe, between undernutrition in childhood and overnutrition and associated diseases in adulthood, seemingly what we call the double burden of malnutrition. So the children who are born with normal birth weight and have normal growth have optimal body composition where children who are born with low birth weight but tend to have rapid catch-up growth have lower muscle mass, but uh, when there is a catch-up growth, there is more accumulation of body fat and it increases the metabolic load in the children. And therefore, there is a very strong focus on improving the nutrition in the first thousand days because early nutrition is really a precursor for later life health. And India has started this flagship program of Pushan Abhiyan, which translates to National Nutrition Mission, uh, with an ambitious aim to reduce stunting by at least 2% per annum and reduce the prevalence from the current level to 25%. Uh, so when we compare this target with actual prevalence reduction, which we see over the years in the National Family Health Service, uh, we can see, see that the annual uh, average reduction was around less than 1%. So uh, the rate of reduction in stunting actually, actually has to triple, uh, increase threefold in order to achieve this target. And that is why the, our study on Action Against Stunting Hub becomes very, very important in providing guidance on how to achieve it. Uh, the basic issue is about, apart from envi other environmental causes, one of the important causes is suboptimal diets of young children. Again, ref uh, quoting from this comprehensive national nutrition survey, uh, we see that only 6% of the children were consuming diets, uh, which can be considered as minimum acceptable diet uh, based on their meal frequency and minimum diet diversity. And when we look at the composition of the diet, diets are monotonous, uh, largely comprised of cereals and millets with very low intakes of say green leafy vegetables, milk, as well as other animal source foods, which provide, uh, which are nutrient dense. Uh, the women's diet, especially pregnant women's diet are also not different. Again, we see that the diets are largely cereal based with very less intake of uh, animal source foods as well as other nutrient dense foods such as green leafy vegetables. And there is a large gap as compared to the uh, quantities consumed, actually consumed as compared to the recommendations. Uh, when we consider the nutrients, uh, there are gaps compared to the estimated average requirement and the actual intakes. Uh, protein seems to be adequate uh, but then protein uh, quantity itself is not enough. Protein quant quality is poor because mainly the protein intake is from the plant sources and the uh, optimal amino acid composition is not available for building the muscle mass. Uh, there is very well known relationship between animal source food intake and childhood stunting. Here the countries are ranked uh, in the ascending order of animal source food intake and India ranks quite low because we know that the animal source food intake in India is low and the prevalence is high. So we see a clearer relation in case of countries where the animal source food intake is low, the stunting seems to be higher. Uh, 
Uh, and this is a schematic which explains uh, the role of animal source foods in the health of adults and children. And because animal source foods are rich in high quality proteins, essential amino acids, uh, retinol, uh, as well as other vitamins, uh, uh, animal intake of animal source foods promotes insulin-like growth factor, which is respond, which which also promotes bone growth as well as linear growth. And it also tends to increase muscle proliferation and increases the lean body mass, which is important for reducing obesity in the long run. Uh, so when we talk of double burden of malnutrition, it's from maternal undernutrition to child undernutrition, which leads to adults with high fat and low muscle mass body composition with increased risk of chronic diseases. And the suboptimal diets with low intake of foods rich in high quality protein and micronutrients seem to be the one of the most important underlying factors. Uh, and it depends on the availability, access and affordability and therefore agriculture becomes very, very important in this food system. Uh, India had tremendous success in terms of green revolution, which was started in 1960s, which made the country food sovereign. Uh, so, uh, afterwards, because the Green Revolution mainly focused on the three staple crops, there was a series of revolutions, which is now termed as Rainbow Revolution, which includes uh, White Revolution for milk, Yellow Revolution for oil seeds, Pink and Blue Revolution for meat and fisheries, Silver Revolution for eggs, um, and Golden Revolution for horticultural crops, particularly fruits and vegetables. So there is a substantial increase in the production, but we see agriculture nutrition disconnect because of the gap in food availability, consumption, and requirement. Only in case of cereals and millets, there is consumption uh, and per capita availability are matching. But when we consider, for example, milk, although the per capita uh, availability is higher, actual consumption is much lower. So is the case in case of fruits, vegetables, as well as pulses. Uh, just giving one example of poultry foods, uh, India ranks one of the highest uh, producers of poultry uh, in the world. But when we consider actual consumption, the consumption is quite low. Poultry production has increased uh, because of increased demand, because of rising incomes. Uh, eggs are also included in social protection, nutrition supplementation programs. Poultry sector has undergone major structural changes during the past two decades with introduction of modern intensive production methods, genetic improvements, improved preventive disease control and biosecurity major. But the increased production itself uh, is not enough for increasing consumption because the prices have not uh, reduced despite increased production. So we see that the prices are not reduced because of uh, with the rising production and therefore there is a huge gap between availability and actual consumption. Uh, on top of that, there is undesirable nutrition transition, uh, which is ongoing uh, more so after the post-economic uh, liberalization in the early 90s. Uh, there is a uh, huge increase in the consumption of ultra-processed foods. You can see that in the periods between uh, 2015 to 20 itself, there has been a lot of increase in the consumption of processed meat and seafoods. And the picture uh, which is shown is quite representative of even small grocery shops uh, in the rural areas. So the packaged foods are available uh, readily. These are convenient and these are liked by children. So there is increasing consumption of calorie dense convenience foods across the social strata in rural and urban areas. Uh, marketing and advertising by these companies adds to the uh, adds to their desirability. Uh, on the other hand, the nutrient-dense perishable foods uh, tend to be uh, consumed in a much lower quantity. And when we look at the reasons, it's actually affordability is not the only reason why the consumption of uh, perishable nutrient-dense foods such as milk and fruits is low. Uh, 
these are the, the table uh, shows our findings from an integrated survey on agriculture and nutrition in two states of india uh, bihar and orissa where the problem of undernutrition is quite high and we can see that uh, uh, when we consider as a percentage of expenses on purchases of on food outside foods and beverage constitute more than 10% and these expenses are even more than some of the other expenses and therefore i think there is a need for uh, consumer uh, awareness also regarding this so uh, previous speakers have spoken about double duty actions for tackling double burden of malnutrition and uh, it's truly an enormous policy challenge for transitioning countries like india uh, that policies and interventions that can simultaneously reduce undernutrition and overnutrition are needed uh, country uh, the policies in india have been traditionally prioritizing the cereal grains and market infrastructure is organized for cereal grains and markets for perishable uh, nutrient dense foods are fragmented uh, the nutrient dense perishable fruits such as foods such as fruits vegetables milk and eggs are confined to fresh markets and highly seasonal uh, there is inadequate post harvest hand handling poor supply chains several intermediaries making these supply chains inefficient and this results in almost 30 to 40 percent loss of produce particularly fruits and vegetables so it is uh, it is uh, so the, the need to strengthen the food systems to enable access to healthier and affordable food actions uh, options while regulating the nutrient poor uh, nutrient poor ultra processed foods cannot be overemphasized so i would like to summarize that uh, summarize my talk but i can skip it uh, it's it's really uh, heartening that we are having this event in the month of september when india is celebrating uh, its the national nutrition month and there are also other policy initiatives such as feed right fit right uh, eat right movement india movement by the uh, launched by the food safety and standards authority of india which promotes eating sustainable, safe, and healthy diets. Uh, and uh, on this background, I'm very, uh, I'm very glad to say that Action Against Stunting Hub, uh, with its evaluation of food environment, value chains, and their impact on child stunting, along with system dynamics modeling, uh, is very well placed to inform policy uh, in this direction. Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of my uh, entire team, which is uh, growing larger and larger for this complex project, I thank each and every one for your patience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Bharati. You brought us right back to the women and children that are involved. Thank you for that. Um, so we're going to have a very short break now because we've got to um, catch up on some time. So we're thinking five minutes. And if you could be back, we can start with the next session. Sorry. Yeah, we could, we could, I mean, or the or the holder, the slide holders. Yeah. Sorry? Slide holders. Yeah, I was just mm -hmm. Right here, can talk. Can talk. You
They have too many screens, so uh, you can speak to them. Hello. Hello, Nim team. How are you? Thank you for joining me. I don't know if we can hear. You might want to speak louder. Yeah, I can't. I'm like, <laughs> hello, Nin team. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can hear. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for all of your, your efforts on actually being done today. We really super appreciate it. So, we're going to start the sessions again. And we've got our two colleagues from Gujarat who are going to join us. Okay, so as we move into the second session, we've got a little bit of time to pick up. Um, but I'd like to introduce our two speakers, our two first speakers. Um, Professor Anish Sinha, he works at the Hub Partner Institution, the Indian Institute of, of Public Health in Gandhinagar. Anish formerly worked with WHO on a national polio surveillance project in India. He's worked with UNDP, um, very experienced, and we're delighted that he's part of the Hub. Professor Kamal Shah, she also works at IIPHG in India at the Indian Institute of Public Health. Her research interests include understanding the biochemical mechanisms underlying various chronic disease conditions, including malnutrition. She has a very keen interest in developing re regression-based models for predict predicting various disease outcomes, um, including stunting. So welcome. Anish and Kamal, the floor is yours. Yeah, just give me a minute. Uh, sorry once again to interrupt. Um, Anish, could you please unmute? Hey Chelsea, we had a small technical issue. I'm sorry. Uh, can you see Dr. Anish's slides? Yes, sorry. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't missing the presentation. Thank you so much. We see them now. Yeah, you can do that. Are you comfortable? Yeah. So very good afternoon uh, to all the participants and to all uh, viewers. Thank you. So I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me a chance to interact here. So I'll be largely speaking on how COVID-19 and its subsequent lockdowns impacted the Integrated Child Development Services scheme that uh, operates in, uh, in India 
and from where the largely the nutritional and uh, immunization services are delivered to the underprivileged sections of the society. So not going much into this, it's largely a flagship program. And of course, since it's in India, the numbers in terms of numbers, it has to be the largest of the world and which is basically the platform to deliver supplementary nutrition, immunization, health checkup, and other services to children up to six years, the pregnant women and adolescents. Then coming to Gujarat, which is one of the Western state of the country, a relatively more developed state, uh, talking about to the ICDS services, which is there, it has uh, operation in uh, 18,000 plus villages with 53,000 Anganwadi centers in th more than 336 projects, and there are more than 58 lakhs beneficiaries. So coming to the COVID, how it, uh, uh, it, it grippled the entire services there. So as we all know, the uh, COVID started in uh, 2019 end when the first case in India was in January 2020. And on 24th March, the government of India announced a nationwide stringent lockdown measures with complete restriction of movements. There were no uh, international or domestic travel allowed. The supply chain system was completely halted, including the essential systems and items, the educational institutes, public healthcare facilities, the private healthcare facilities were completely closed. However, these were visible. It has deeper impacts like the ICDS, the Anganwadi centers were completely closed for two reasons, largely for two reasons, as the Anganwadi workers were very much engaged in the COVID response activities, the surveillance activities, and also the beneficiaries were uh, avoiding to go to such places. And hence the ICDS, the entire system was completely closed uh, halting the essential uh, nutritional and immunization services and other activities. Many other essential activities like healthcare, nutritional services, immunization, maternal health and child health services all got disrupted. There were disruptions of drug, logistic and laboratory services. This all uh, problems were uh, uh, aggravated by the massive migration of workers uh, because, because of the lockdown, there were no jobs and no earning, and hence the migrants were uh, started moving, walking thousands of miles to their native places. This uh, added a very complex problems for the government. Even the public distribution systems for providing ration to the poor were closed. However, government made its effort to provide food to almost more than half of the population free of cost. So with these challenges, how the government responded, like uh, the, with the WHO support from WHO, the IAPAG tried to uh, document all responses of the government in terms of the interaction review, which is available at Girna WHO IAR. Uh, this was basically the government's response tried to document on 10 pillars, like how they responded for the coordination, planning, risk communication, and other activities which were required for COVID control. The one of the important thing which is relevant today uh, for this event is the maintaining the essential health services of nutrition, basic health care. So this was very, very important. We will see how the government tried to respond to this challenge, uh, maintaining the essential health services like nutrition, routine immunization, antenatal care, tuberculosis, treatment continuations, NCDs, and et cetera. So how the Anganwadi centers were completely closed for one month during the initial lockdown. So it was very difficult for the government, but then immediately the mobile health vans uh, were introduced, what we call it as Dhanvantri Arogyarats across the state to provide basic health services to the women, children, and other citizens of the country. Then the take-home rations, which were as Anganwadi Center was not operational, so take-home rations were delivered at doorsteps uh, for uh, children from uh, six months to three years and pregnant and lactating women. Also, the supplementary nutrition were provided for three years to six years. These are all doorstep delivered. And for an informal or a preschool education, which is one of the important activity at the Anganwadi centers, the technology was used, the BISEC, the digital platforms and other live tube channels were uh, used for providing this education. Then following the uh, uh, three months of the lockdown, uh, the unlocking started and the government issued directives to the states uh, 
to initiate the ANC checkups and anthropometric measurements, routine immunization in at least the non-containment zones of the state and the country. Now, the post-COVID scenarios, uh, it took pretty long to come back. As we all know, after the first wave, some relaxations were there in the uh, lockdowns. Then we had a devastating second wave in the country. Uh, then uh, uh, relatively weaker third wave. So now things are getting back to normal. Uh, so the children started attending Anganwadi centers regularly only during from Feb 2022. All services of the ICDS systems are being restored with appropriate COVID protocols. The technology is being further used as COVID gave an opportunity to uh, digitalize many of our things. So telemedicine is being still uh, continued. The systems are the uh, frontline workers were trained to find out uh, children who have missed their routine vaccinations to get uh, uh, vaccinated. And since this year's uh, early, uh, this, uh, early 2022, uh, the Mamta Divas, what we call it as village health and nutrition days, uh, targeting pregnant women are fully functional with essential services like vaccination and folic acid supplementation and referral of high risk pregnancies to higher centers. And the uh, home uh, take home ration and cooked food are also made available to beneficiaries like the pre pandemic levels uh, currently in the country. Now, this is what we know the uh, COVID, its infections, the immediate impacts, the lockdowns, its uh, disruption of the essential services. And we have been trying to address those. How the thing that we still are not very clear what could be the long term impact of uh, COVID infection on maternal and child health which is yet to be fully assessed or understood. So the one of the major activity of the hub in IPAG is that we are trying to assess or understand the long-term impact in COVID infected antenatal women. So we have tried to enroll uh, from two districts, uh, Ahmedabad and Savarkata, uh, the pregnant women who were uh, COVID positive and the, those who were COVID negative, and we'll be following it for further like uh, outcomes of uh, the pregnancy outcome, the nutrition, early childhood development, the milestones. And my colleague will speak more on this. To sum up, the government is trying to build a resilient ICDS system as it is a one of the mainstay of the delivery platform for nutrition and immunization to a relatively underprivileged section of the society. So what, has, what is being uh, done there is a preparedness and mitigation plan for future such pandemics. More needs to be done in the infrastructure of the Anganwadi Center, capacity building of the supervisory cadres, the concurrent monitoring, mid-course correction, and coordination with various departments as this uh, ICDS is run by the Women and Child Development Ministry. And hence, we need more coordination with the health and other uh, ministries and the departments. Thank you. I now request my colleague to take it forward. Yeah, hello everyone. This is Dr. Komal Shah from Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhi Nagar. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anish, for setting the stage uh, regarding the COVID and what kind of studies we at IPG are doing under this hub related activities. Uh, so I'll be more specific uh, uh, with the kind of activities that IPG is doing. And uh, uh, to take it forward, uh, I would specify that we are currently working on two cohorts. The first cohort, that pre-COVID cohort, where uh, Prof. Anish has uh, shared that we, were, we are establishing a cohort of mothers who were infected during the time of this COVID, uh, and uh, we want to follow them up for a larger duration and want to see what happens to these mothers and the children who are born during that particular period. So I'll take you to this journey and the kind of cohort that we are enrolling right now. So we want to understand the impact of COVID-19 infection during pregnancy on maternal and child health uh, outcome and the indicators. And we want to establish the cohort from Gujarat. 
So objective is to generate the evidence on the effect of COVID-19 exposure during pregnancy and want to see that what are the general health indicators related situation happening to mothers and the kids, as well as their mental health overall growth indicators, what is happening to that. We also want to document this nutritional status related aspects and other health indicators to, in the babies as well as in the mothers and want to compare this with their respective counterpart. It means that we will have a control and the uh, case arm. So cases will be the mothers who are already infected and versus the uh, um, other mothers who have delivered during that time, but they were not infected with COVID-19. And we want to compare both of these uh, parts together. We also want to see the vaccination impact on this outcome indicators. So what happened in India during the second wave, there was a provision that these mothers, they cannot get the vaccine. Then there was a change in the strategy and their vaccination was available for this mother. So our cohort is a combination of all this different uh, kind of risk factors and the profiles. So we want to see that whether vaccination has changed the status of this health indicators in mother and kids, or it, we might be wrong also. So we want to see what happens with these vaccinations. Okay, so these are some of the parameters that we will be assessing. We will be seeing the socioeconomic profile. Uh, we will be seeing the birth outcome related indicators. We'll be seeing the health indicators details. We'll be seeing that uh, a biochemical investigation, the clinical profile, how they come up with their mortality indicators. And we'll be following up this cohort for a reasonably decent amount of time. So we'll be focusing on their early childhood development indicators also. Uh, we'll be focusing on mother's anthropometric indicators and how they can affect their overall outcome. Uh, as far as kids were concerned, we want to focus on birth defect. We want to uh, focus on their immunization status. We want to focus on their nutritional practices and status of COVID infection in uh, uh, kids themselves also and uh, overall their nutritional indicators. Yeah, this is a bit about the biochemical era, uh, estimations. We felt that uh, uh, in COVID infection, biochemical estimations played a really huge role. There are certain infections which were quite similar to COVID. When biochemistry uh, was involved, we got to know that with these indicators, we can predict some of the long-term consequences of this infection. That is why we are focusing on estimations of the biochemical parameters in mother as well as children and try to see with this biochemical estimations what can we predict. Can we predict their uh, uh, like implications with the NCD related parameter? Can we predict something called long COVID in this mothers and uh, does it persistently stay with the kids also? So some of the biochemical parameters in mothers and children we are expecting to do and uh, uh, establish and correlate in this cohort. So we, uh, uh, we have already got two districts on board from Gujarat. One is from the urban setup and one is from the rural tribal setup. And we are expecting to enroll around uh, 300 participants. As of now, we have enrolled 230 participants. Uh, the, the children's age range from four to 27 months. And uh, some of the kids, they were falling into the first wave criteria. We could enroll the mothers who were infected during the first wave. During the second and the third wave, uh, the distribution of this uh, cohort is like majority of this uh, participant are coming from the second wave, which was much more, uh, what do you say, uh, cruel to this cohort, I would say. A lot of mortality uh, was uh, like found in, uh, sec during the second wave. And uh, third wave, yeah, reasonably smaller sample size because uh, not majority of the infection was noted during the third wave. So overall, uh, the distribution during the wave uh, uh, can be seen like this. Yes, uh, so we want to like focus on the dissemination of the finding also. So how we have developed the cohort, what all activities we are planning to do with this cohort before establishing this cohort, what all pre-exercise we have done. So like uh, uh, evidence mapping, how we have generated the evidence, uh, global evidence, and how this go global evidence have guided these particular studies. So that all things we would like to like disseminate in the public domain through uh, various reports and publication. 
way forward, yes, uh, along with the biochemical estimation, we'll complete the uh, sample size that we have calculated for this particular cohort. Apart from that, we would like to focus on the early childhood development, uh, how uh, these kids are doing as compared to their control counterparts. Yes, this was about the first cohort. Uh, now moving to the second in the prime cohort, where we are establishing a, 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 like a cohort of stunted uh, children, and we are also establishing uh, their counterparts and want to see that what kind of indicators are contributing in, uh, with the perspective of stunting from India. So uh, we would like to dig out more on the contextual factors. So I'll skip this uh, facts and figures uh, because my previous speakers have already talked about this. Yes, coming back to the cohorts and our own study. So we want to estimate the prevalence of stunting in Indian countries, as well as we want to focus on the risk factors of stunting. We want to see how caregiving practices, environmental hygiene and domestic environment can influence the growth outcome. We want to see the practice related to breastfeeding, complementary feeding and wash, how the, it can influence stunting in our context. Okay, so initially in 2016 and 17, we already established a cohort of 4,000 mothers and kids. And we want to follow that cohort for like a precipitation of stunting and see uh, that what kind of risk factors are there in the kids who are stunted, uh, family side risk factor. We want to see their wash practices. We want to see that maternal factors and we might see their biochemical parameters also. Uh, before going into this detailed analysis, we tried to study the uh, 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 like uh, uh, qualitative observations from the kids and their families. And that is why we planned an ethnographic study where four stunted kids, uh, our researchers, actually they, they spend some good amount of time with these families and try to understand their practices which might be contributed to the uh, malnutrition and stunting. So for that, we took a data of really, uh, like a household characteristic, child feeding practices, food hygiene amongst this household. We also pay attention to their sanitation and other hygiene practices, animal exposure and sanitizations. And after that, we moved to a larger cohort where we are aiming to like enroll 1300 <laughs> participants by and large. Uh, and uh, this participations, uh, participants uh, detail, they were designed based on our ethnographic study and uh, systematic reviews that we did along with our partners from uh, London School. Yes, I'll skip this. Basically, we will enroll the participants who are born uh, within the uh, time frame of 2016 to 17, who themselves are not suffering from any diseases, who are willing to participate in this study. Okay, so I'll skip this with the time perspective in mind. Yes, so by and large, we'll be for paying focus to uh, their socioeconomic status, their wash practices, anthropometric parameters, individual dietary diversity, water access, and access to safety net programs. Yeah, I'll skip this. Yeah, so at the end of this thing, we, we want to identify the risk factors for stunting, and we also want to develop the models which can predict stunting quite early, and we can give these models to our state health programs and see if that can be integrated as a policy where uh, we can predict stunting right after birth, we can predict stunting after six months, and we can predict stunting at the end of two years. Yes, so this will also have a couple of publications as a dissemination plan. And these are some of the uh, field practices related glimpse. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank oh, you for thank your time. You. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal and Anish. That was really brilliant. You took us right straight to Gujarat and these cohorts. Thank you so much for taking us through. Okay, so um, our last speaker this session is uh, Umi Fahida Hamida. She's the country lead uh, for the Action Against Stunting, uh, Stunting Hub. She's a senior researcher and program coordinator of early childhood care, nutrition, and education at the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization. Regional Center for Food and Nutrition, uh, Semio Rekfan, as we as we know it. Um, her interests are in nu nu nutrient and non-nutrient interactions related to child growth, and in using linear and goal programming to develop and evaluate food-based recommendations. Umi, a very hearty welcome from London. Thank you, Claire.
Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from uh, Indonesia. And this is uh, my pleasure on this uh, Action Again uh, Stunting Day to share with you update from the Action Against Stunting Hub of Cohort Study in Lombok. Uh, and we would like to share a little bit of uh, the update from the study as well as uh, some uh, uh, of our previous work in relation to uh, today's uh, topic uh, uh, related to the food system. And this is the line of my uh, talks. So briefly uh, about stunting in Indonesia, uh, this graph show uh, the uh, downward trend of the stunting reduction from 20, 2007 to 2019 uh, of a rate of reduction of less than 1% a year. And now a uh, stunting reduction is the commitment of this government. And we aim to uh, uh, aim for stunting prevalence by 14% by 2024. 20, uh, and this means a big challenge uh, because uh, this means we need to really accelerate the stunting reduction by over 3% a year. And uh, during the period of 2019 and 2021, which coincides with the uh, COVID-19 pandemics, as you can see here, over 500 uh, districts in Indonesia, while nearly 70% had uh, a decrease in stunting, we still have a challenge of around 30% of the districts and instead experience an increase in the stunting uh, prevalence. Uh, there are not uh, much uh, data until the level of the district uh, level, so let me share you what we have done uh, from the previous studies in East Lombok. This is actually uh, quite an, an old uh, study just before the year of 2000, where we captured the linear growth of six to 18 months children. And as you can see here, we start to see a significant decrease in complementary uh, in a uh, line for age scores during the complementary feeding period. And in this study also, this situation is accompanied by very high anemia at a uh, six month of over 80%. And about a decade later, uh, still in the area of uh, East Lombok district, we also uh, found still a high prevalence of anemia among the under two children. And we also have more information that they are also uh, predominantly also iron deficiency anemia. And while we also identified that uh, intake, especially of iron and folate uh, were inadequate, we identified that this population also have a, a iron lowering allele in the TMPRSS6 uh, gene polymorphism, uh, which uh, makes them uh, really prone to having a, a low hemoglobin uh, level. So uh, I would like to uh, share uh, in this uh, uh, topic about the uh, food system, particularly on the consumer behavior, which we think is the key uh, to supporting uh, a proper and adequate complementary feeding. And this is also from the study area in East Lombok, where we identified uh, using the linear programming that uh, the complementary feeding diet of these uh, under two children were inadequate in iron, zinc, and calcium. So they are the problem nutrients. At the same time, they are available locally uh, foods uh, which are nutrient dense in these uh, problem nutrients, such as liver, fish, and anchovy. And our intervention has also uh, shown a significant increase in the intakes of animal source food, as mentioned by previous speakers, also in uh, increase in the intakes and dense, uh, nutrient densities of these uh, problem nutrients, iron, zinc, and calcium. And we also have uh, tested this in the setting, uh, uh, in emergency setting post the uh, uh, 2018 earthquake in East, uh, in East uh, Lombok. And uh, we, uh, we found that uh, this uh, food-based approaches uh, is uh, effective in uh, improving nutrition status of the children, lowering morbidity and also lowering maternal stress. So the importance of also taking care of the special situation like emergency setting uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is important. And uh, Taking account of those previous findings of the importance of looking into the local specificity when uh, guiding uh, uh, consumer behavior, 
uh, we also have uh, done uh, more uh, analysis using linear programming for 10 stunting priority districts uh, uh, in Indonesia. And it uh, also revealed the same uh, findings where calcium, iron, things are typical problem nutrients. At the same time, also folate. And this actually highlights the importance of the link between uh, the intake and the food availability because actually there are uh, locally available foods which are good sources of these problem uh, nutrients. So uh, in this action again, a stunting day which we uh, celebrate uh, today, uh, I would like to share how actually uh, we can help to reach the research gap and policy uh, using our approach. Indeed, I have uh, mentioned that in terms of the food uh, environment, uh, there is a potential to reduce uh, undernutrition and stunting uh, through the food-based approaches using the locally available foods. But uh, we also believe that uh, we, also, we need the whole child perspective in looking at the food system, meaning we need to also take into account the deep biology, including the epigenetics, the gut health components, we also need to take into account a wider perspective of the environment, not only on the food system, but also on the immediate uh, home environment of the children and on the education environment of the children. And with this wider perspective, it is expected that we can better understand the stunting pathology, which will help us to better uh, reduce the stunting more effectively and using uh, this uh, uh, study also action against stunting, how we expect that we can help to support a more uh, a supportive tool like cognitive screening, best practice guidelines for early childhood care, and uh, eventually, of course, the decision support tool for policymakers, planners, and academics. And uh, what uh, we can update uh, for uh, from Indonesian team during the uh, February to September 2001, which is uh, still in the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, we, uh, we can uh, 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 accomplish the recruitment of our 702 uh, pregnant mothers at the second trimester of uh, pregnancy. And as you can see here, uh, we try to also accommodate uh, through, the, uh, through the figures uh, of the increase and decrease of the COVID-19 uh, cases. Uh, this is uh, made possible with the great support from the local governments uh, of the East Lombok, which we are very grateful. And also, of course, by following the health uh, 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 protocol uh, strictly throughout the study. And uh, up to now, we have uh, progressed. Uh, 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 our oldest children have reached uh, above one year old. This is just to illustrate the types of samples and the timing of uh, the sample collections that the study team uh, collected. So this is going to be uh, quite a comprehensive uh, indicators generated from different type of sample. And we hope this can also be an investment for a better understanding of uh, uh, stunting pathology. And uh, currently what we can update you is that uh, these are uh, the profile of our uh, cohort uh, mothers. Mostly they are uh, housewives or completing uh, secondary schools. Uh, a quarter of them is, had their first uh, pregnancies. We had the 22% of mothers having chronic energy deficiency. The prevalence of anemia is uh, still high, uh, uh, 41%. And also important to note that they are also mostly passive smokers, uh, nearly 80%. And we are lucky that in this uh, uh, rural area of Lombok, uh, not uh, many mothers were uh, positive uh, uh, during the COVID-19, uh, as you can see here. But in fact, uh, the COVID also affect the livelihood. As you can see also the food security status of the household around 28% uh, actually had a low and very low food security status. So in summary, uh, uh, we we shared the uh, the figures in Indonesia and East uh, Lombok where stunting and anemia remain a challenge uh, even uh, uh, over a decade and this uh, actually highlight the importance of uh, on one side food based approaches 
which are promising to solve undernutrition problem. And uh, we would like to also highlight that when we would like to uh, increase the effectiveness of food-based approaches, it is very important to consider local uh, context, such as the specific problem nutrients and locally available nutrient dense food. And apart from the diet, we also believe that other aspects related to the deep biology and a wider uh, aspect of the environment uh, with the whole chart approach that the heart is uh, uh, using will better uh, help us to understand about stunting typology for more effective stunting reduction. So today we talk about the investment for a just transition to food the system. I think a just transition is also when we take into account the local context. And so the food system will be more effective. And finally, we are thankful to all partners who support us. So despite this COVID-19 pandemics, we can proceed with the recruitment of our action against stunting hub cohort mothers. So thank you for all the partners in the central uh, uh, and uh, local governments, including also our academic uh, partners. And we would like to share with you the spirit from our field teams in Lombok, which is after our regular refresher training and standardizations. We have also team building to keep uh, motivating them to achieve the goal of the hub. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Umi. That was really delightful to explicate the whole child approach. Thank you for that. All right. I think we've, um, because we're a little running over time, I think we should maybe skip the next break and move on to the next present set of presentations. And uh, so our first presentation is from uh, Grania Maloney. Grania is a senior advisor at UNICEF headquarters in New York in early childhood nutrition, where she leads on young child diets. Previously, she worked for uh, UNICEF's East and Southern Africa Regional Office. Prior to this, she served as the Chief of Nutrition with UNICEF Kenya and the Chief Technical Advisor for Food Security and Nutrition Analysis Unit in Somalia. Welcome, Ganya. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning from New York, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are, and good evening around the world. I'm delighted to be here today as a for, former alumni, of course, of the London School as well. So I'm going to go through UNICEF's approach to the prevention of all forms of childhood malnutrition, including stunting, by discussing our 10-year uh, our nutrition strategy. So we launched this 10-year strategy in 2021. And this strategy guides our global nutrition programs to lead us to the final decade to the SDGs in 20. 30. The strategy celebrates that in the last two decades, globally, we have reduced the prevalence of child stunting by one third and the number of stunted children by 55 million. We have also seen important progress in infant feeding. For example, the number of children who are exclusively breastfed today is 80 million higher than in 2000. And of course, that's contributing to the results we're seeing in stunting reduction. And these are great achievements, and it's important to acknowledge this because they show that positive change for nutrition is possible and is happening at scale across regions. However, there's much work to be done, as while the prevalence of stunting has declined in all regions, including in Africa, the rate of decline is not sufficient to reach our 2030 SDG target. Further progress on child wasting has been slow at best. And the number of children with overweight and obesity has increased in all regions, including in Africa. In summary, when we look at all the indicators on child malnutrition, one in three children under five years of age globally is not growing because of malnutrition. And this includes all forms of malnutrition, both under and overweight and obesity. And at least two in three children are not being fed even the minimum diverse diet they need for healthy growth and development. Low and middle income countries suffer from the triple burden of child malnutrition, of course, that has been referred to several occasions so far today. Now, the face of malnutrition is changing. Again, many speakers have referred to it and new forces are driving this triple burden of malnutrition. Globalization and urbanization is changing how our children are being fed. Climate change and inequities are limiting av availability and affordability of nutritious food. 
And humanitarian crisis and the COVID pandemic is affecting the most vulnerable, the youngest and the poorest. Therefore, within this context, UNICEF's nutrition strategy aims to achieve two things. One is that we need to protect the gains that we have made in the past two decades that I just illustrated. And two, that we need to accelerate progress towards the SDG targets for nutrition in this changing world. So on that basis, the vision of our nutrition strategy is a world where all children, adolescents and women realize their right to nutrition. And this vision is guided by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which recognizes that adequate nutrition is the right of every child. The goal of our nutrition strategy is to protect and promote diets, services and practices that support optimal nutrition for all women, children um, ad and adolescents. And this goal supports the goal of the 2030 Agenda to ensure children's access to nutrition diets and to end child malnutrition in all its forms. The universal principle of this strategy for all nutrition programs globally across all regions and all countries is that prevention of all forms of malnutrition comes first in all contexts. And if prevention fails, treatment is a must. Therefore, on this basis, our strategy has four specific objectives. The first three aim to prevent the triple burden of malnutrition in early childhood, as you'll see, to prevent undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies and overweight in the first five years of life. In middle childhood and adolescence, but between five to 18, in women during pregnancy and breastfeeding, while objective four aims to ensure the early detection and treatment of wasting and other forms of life-threatening malnutrition. Our strategy is guided by our UNICEF's conceptual framework on the determinants of maternal and child nutrition that we released and updated in 2021. Now, many of you will be familiar with the original conceptual framework, which of course was released in 1990, but this one has been updated in line with uh, global um, developments. And the framework builds on that previous conceptual work by UNICEF, but it differs from it in three distinct ways. Number one, it acknowledges that the changing face of malnutrition is real, that we have a triple burden of undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies and overweight. Number two, it highlights the role of diets and care as the immediate determinants of nutrition for children, adolescents and women across the life course. And number three, and very importantly, it uses a positive narrative about what contributes good nutrition, providing conceptual clarity about the enabling, underlying and immediate determinants of good nutrition and how they are all connected to each other. UNICEF's nutrition programs also aims to make five key systems better equipped and more accountable to deliver nutritious diets, essential nutrition services, positive nutrition practices for children and women. And these five systems are the food system, the health system, the water and sanitation system, the education system, and the social protection system. And the four objectives outlined in our strategy require engagement with, mo with, it, with more than one of these systems at any one time to achieve results. For example, improving the quality of young children's diets in early childhood requires a food system that provides and produces nutritious foods that are available and affordable to family, a health system with well-trained staff in facilities and communities to counsel caregivers on child feeding, and a social protection system that reduces inequities by ensuring that nutritious foods are available to vulnerable children and women. In summary, our nutrition strategy to 2030 embraces six strategic shifts to respond to the changing face of child malnutrition. The first one is that we have a universal vision which is relevant to all countries and regions. And indeed our strategy can be applied in Chile or Somalia and all other countries. Our strategy acknowledges a strong focus on addressing the triple burden of malnutrition. We focus on a comprehensive life cycle approach to programming that includes young children, school-aged children and adolescents. 
we place a deliberate emphasis on improving children's diets, services and practices as the three, as the three key drivers of good nutrition in children. We pay a greater attention to the private sector engagement in terms of working on the private sector to play their part in ensuring that nutritious foods are available for our young children. And finally, we apply a systems approach that strengthens the capacity of the food, health, education and social protection systems to deliver nutrition results at scale. In our current strategic plan, which will take us from 2021 to December 2025, we have identified globally as UNICEF three flagship results. So by 2025, we will um, ensure that at least 300 million children under five will benefit from programs for the prevention of stunting and all other forms of malnutrition globally, annually. And by 2025, at least 100 million adolescents will benefit from programs for the prevention of anemia and other forms of malnutrition annually. And then finally, by 2025, at least 50 million children under five will benefit from programs for the early detection and treatment of severe wasting annually. This is our, our UNICEF team uh, globally. We, in 2020, about 640, 650 rather, nutrition staff and over 1,500 consultants from across the globe. So with this global footprint, UNICEF, with all of you partners online and working directly with national governments, is well placed to support the rollout of our strategy. And this nutrition strategy is not just for the nutrition team across the world in UNICEF. This is a whole of UNICEF approach to how we will prioritize nutrition at scale. You can find our nutrition strategy and all the related documents on our website. You'll see the link here. And otherwise, thank you very much for the opportunity. Branya, thank you very much for that. And thank you for bringing us back to the triple burden of malnutrition. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sal Morris. He's the Director of Program Services Team at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN. He leads on technical support and quality assurance on the organization's program portfolio across Asia and Africa. And his work focuses on food fortification, supply chains for nutritious foods, and the contextual drivers of food systems change. And Sal was previously at LSHTM, uh, so welcome back. Um, and he's also been a research fellow at IFPRI. The floor is yours, Sal. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be back in an institution where I both studied and worked. So uh, it's a real thrill to be here today. I'm going to talk today about concrete actions to advance a just transition in sustainable food systems and food security. That was a big topic, so I decided to narrow it down a bit and talk about something that's already been mentioned by some of the previous speakers, the case of animal source foods. And the reason I chose that was because I really feel that animal source foods uh, represent a challenge to us both for equity and for sustainability. These are two themes that have been brought up in earlier presentations. This uh, figure, which I took from an article that came out this year in Lancet Planetary Health, really illustrates the equity point. So if you are an average Russian, you might be eating nearly six servings of animal source foods every day. That's really rather a lot and far more than probably is good for you. They would be well advised to eat a little less. On the other hand, if you live in Tanzania, you'll be eating less than one portion of animal source foods a day, which uh, particularly for these populations that we're talking about today for young children is clearly uh, uh, less than would be desirable. And the uh, data, uh, I just uh, brought up two uh, meta-analyses and systemic reviews, uh, uh, systematic reviews that have been uh, published in the last year and a bit, um, but you heard other discussions today of all of the data that convinces us that animal source foods are important in the prevention of stunting. Actually, I'm used to audiences that are very hostile to animal source foods, so it's quite nice being in a group today uh, which is prepared to look at them more positively. So, but all animal source foods are not created equally. 
So this is a slightly complicated figure. It's uh, uh, showing us data from Mozambique and for five different groups of animal source foods. So each panel contains five columns and the columns are ranged from the left, which is the poorest 20% of the population up to the right, which is the uh, richest 20% of the population. And when those columns are in red and go above the, above the uh, uh, central line, that means that those people who are, access, who are able to access this food do so primarily through market channels. So they're paying cash to get their hands on this food. And when the columns are below the line, it means that they're primarily accessing it through home production. And the uh, darker shading indicates that it's quite commonly consumed and the pale shading indicates rather rarely consumed by uh, most people. So what you see here is a very different pattern. So for fish, most of the population in Mozambique is eating fish reasonably regularly, regardless of their socioeconomic status. And they're almost universally obtaining that by paying cash for it. You know, on the other extreme, Eggs are uh, consumed uh, to any degree, any, oops, you're not able to see that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, eggs are really only consumed to any substantial degree by the richest 20% of the population who buy them. But for the rest of the 80% of the population, if they do get them at all, it's from home production. So this is a bit of a paradox because Mozambique is a very rural country. And 60%, over 60%, in fact, of Mozambican farmers do own chicken. So why would they not be able to eat eggs? You'd think that you, every time you go into an African village, you see chicken running around. Why would they not be able to eat uh, eggs? Well, the answer is uh, uh, African village chicken are very low productivity. They produce on average about 80 eggs a year per chicken, which by our standards in Northern hemisphere is very, very low productivity. The chicken are uh, eaten by predators, suffer from diseases uh, or stolen. And um, when eggs are uh, uh, when when eggs are available, they tend to be kept because uh, for a poor villager, uh, this represents a, a huge uh, investment, and so they hatch them out and keep to keep the size of the flock. And the flock sizes are very small, talking about ten, maybe ten chicken per household. So this transition that we're talking about, a just and sustainable transition, how in those circumstances, in that very concrete example, how could we make that happen? Well, there are uh, breeds of chicken that are far, far higher productivity. So this is a magnificent Sasso chicken, and it produces 230 eggs per year, as opposed to the 80 that I just told you about. And not only that, but when it's finished its laying life, it can be eaten. Sorry about that. Um, so there's two, sort, two benefits from having this, what's called a hybrid chicken that's both uh, good for laying and good for uh, meat. Um, but it has some downsides as well. And it has another advantage, sorry, which is that um, you really only need to, to give it commercial feed in the very, when it's a very young chick. And when they're older chicken, they can pretty much get by on scavenging in the bush or a mixed diet is fine. But it does have a downside. It's a designer chicken. It's been produced by geneticists. And so these traits are not passed from generation to generation. So the farmers would need to rebuy uh, chicks from the hatchery every generation, as happens with uh, some of the GMO crops that we're used to. So plus side and downside, what does that uh, mean? Well, uh, as I'll, I'll suggest to you, I believe that this is definitely, uh, uh, the downside is worth, worth taking because the advantage is huge. Um, but in order for this to, in order for this transition to happen, in order to make villagers switch to this uh, new breed, uh, somebody has to provide them with the chicks, provide them with other inputs, maybe vaccines, the commercial feed for the young chicks. And then there has to be a system whereby if they are going to produce all of these extra eggs, those eggs have to be taken to market and sold in order that they generate a uh, uh, profit. 
So the question is, who's going to make all of these things happen? Is it going to be the public sector? So do we expect agricultural extension workers to go to every village in Mozambique and to make this happen? I would suggest that's probably unrealistic. They have neither the resources to travel like that, nor the skills to persuade people to do it. Or is there somehow a profitable business model that could make this happen as a private uh, business? And I, I think it's very exciting to hear this week as we're talking, there's a big meeting happening uh, in Kigali and the results of these so-called egg hubs are being pre presented. And there's now clear evidence that this can be made to work as a profitable business. So I can't go into the, I don't have the time to go into the details here, but what this shows, this is the financials from a project that the NGO Solidaridad did in Mozambique. Basically, you spend 11 euros on the inputs for this uh, as a farmer for this uh, business cycle, and you get 24 and a half euros out of it as income. So that's a pretty good profit margin of 55%. And you can also do similar financial analysis for the facilitating organization and that works as well. So it really looks like there is a business model that can make this work. As we know, there are uh, environmental risks to increasing animal source food production. At GAIN, we have developed our own environmental screening tool. We needed something that was relatively easy to apply because we have 100 projects and they're run by people who are not environmental specialists. So we needed a tool that all of those teams could use uh, easily. And we try and look at both uh, the potential risks to the environment and also, but also the opportunities. And what we find with animal source foods, obviously there are big risks to water, for fish production, to land use for some of the land animals, but potentially there are things that you can do to mitigate these and create a positive story environmentally as well. So what I've talked about is very specific uh, interventions that could be uh, undertaken to try and uh, change access to animal source foods. But that is sounds like a little series of project by projects. How do you turn this into a whole, uh, how do you turn this into something that's truly societally and economically transformative? Three points I'm going to uh, propose to you. The first has been mentioned uh, by other speakers, such as Patrizia Farakasi earlier on, which is to take a whole system approach. It's not going to be enough to just look at production of these nu uh, nutrient dense foods. We need to carry on through the value chain and think about distribution, think about retail, think about the consumers and how they're going to be persuaded to consume these foods. And we need to link these into uh, the bigger societal changes that are happening all around us. How is this relevant to uh, the increased risk of conflict that we live in in the world at the moment? How do we deal with environmental risks? How do we empower women through these actions as well? And it's not one organization that can possibly take on all of those components of this big uh, transformative effort. It needs to be a vast coalition of multiple uh, organizations uh, somehow lightly coordinated through some coordination platform, which is easier said than done. This is something that we're trying to do in GAIN, but I think many other organizations also, the World Economic Forum I know, is uh, very interested in this idea. The second point is to target the poorest. We can't just assume that these things are going to benefit the poorest. These foods are expensive. So we've got two options here. Either we can go the industrialization route of production and we can uh, reap economies of scale, or if you reject that route of, of uh, food system transformation, you can look at other things that can be done, but they're at a smaller, more local scale, like uh, selling uh, what are seen as inferior parts of the chicken, for example, I put the, the legs here, or packaging in a way that reduces costs. But these are a little bit more details at the edges. Sorry, this, this company is a company that we've supported in Kenya, and it does all of these things quite effectively. And finally, uh, a key thing to get that just element in the transformation is uh, involving actors in their own future. Uh, we often um, look straight through the vendors who sit in traditional markets and hardly see them and don't think of them as players or, or, or transformers in their own right and creators of our future. 
but these are the people at the end of the supply chain and they need to be fully involved, uh, empowered and linked up to uh, the kind of global uh, initiatives that we're sitting in right here now. Thank you very much. That's what I had to share with you. Thanks very much, Sal. That was great coming back to animal source foods and chickens in particular. Thank you for that. So our last speaker and definitely last but not least is Professor Baba Carfe. He's the country lead in Senegal for the hub. He's a professor of parasitology at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Cheikh Anta Diop. Babakar's research interest lies in molecular epidemiology, immunology, treatment and control of parasitic diseases. Welcome, Babakar. Uh, thank you, Claire, for uh, giving me the floor. Uh, sorry for, uh, I will uh, do my presentation in French as we have a presentation. So, uh, for this, uh, <laughs> for this time, I have this opportunity to, to talk in my uh, language. So, a little bit <laughs> by uh, listening in, uh, in French, but uh, you had a translation. So, uh, could you please uh, share my presentation, uh, Chelsea or uh, Dinesh? Yes, welcome. In a minute. Uh, Babka, you want it in English, right? Yes, you can uh, share the presentation. Yes, hear you. Can you see the screen? Yeah, thank you. Très bien. Merci beaucoup à tous. Uh, nous sommes heureux encore une fois de participer à cette deuxième journée de la malnutrition que nous avons l'opportunité d'organiser. So, Babakar, quick, yeah. sorry. Uh, can you switch to English? Yes, 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 you have the... Oh, we switch. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'll switch. Yes. Okay. Donc, euh, nous avons cette opportunité que nous offre notre hub euh, d'organiser cette journée annuelle qui nous permet un peu d'échanger euh, sur euh, cette thématique. Et pour cette année, moi, j'ai choisi un peu de sortir des sentiers battus parce que tout à l'heure, depuis tout à l'heure, nous avons eu des brillantes présentations faites par des scientifiques de haute valeur et qui nous ont un peu plus ou moins entretenus de différents éléments. Alors, moi, je vais un peu faire un cri du cœur et être le porte-parole des scientifiques que nous sommes euh, au niveau notamment des pays pauvres tout simplement parce que effectivement on se rend compte que euh, la recherche, notamment la recherche liée à la malnutrition, est plus ou moins le parent pauvre de nos euh, institutions de recherche au niveau des pays qui sont euh, en voie de développement, si on peut dire. Slide, s'il vous plaît. Euh, nous nous sommes tous rendus compte, euh, go back please, nous nous sommes tous rendus compte que notre, nos pays, euh, ou en tout cas les, les chiffres actuels que nous avons dans nos pays, ont montré que euh, les tendances actuelles euh, ne vont pas peut-être vers l'atteinte des objectifs que nous nous sommes fixés euh, pour l'horizon 2030, avec une réduction assez importante de la malnutrition et de tous les éléments qui vont avec. Et euh, les estimations qui ont été faites euh, après les, les trois dernières années qui ont fortement impacté nos pays, euh, montre des tendances euh, assez euh, plus ou moins euh, alarmistes hein, du fait euh, d'une réduction très faible que nous avons obtenue et ceci est lié certainement euh, au contexte que nous avons vécu ces dernières années. Et nos pays, notamment en Afrique de l'Ouest, je vais prendre des pays comme l'Afrique de l'Ouest, hein, euh, où la malnutrition sévit de façon très importante, euh, les pays comme le Sénégal, comme la Mauritanie, le Mali, tout ça, nous souffrons beaucoup euh, de cette euh, situation actuelle que nous vivons et que, qui impacte fortement euh, nos pays. Nous avons euh, comme euh, élément que nous avons subi, hein, donc vous le savez tous, le Covid, on en parle beaucoup, euh, tout le monde l'a subi, même si au niveau de notre pays, en termes de prévalence, euh, nous avons eu moins de cas euh, que dans les pays du Nord, mais euh, l'impact que cela a eu dans les pays nordistes, a 
fortement impacté euh, sur le plan économique euh, nos pays. Ce qui fait que donc, euh, nous le subissons euh, comme une seconde vague euh, du fait euh, voilà, de, de ces impacts qui, qui existent au niveau de ces pays du Nord. Les changements climatiques, nous les vivons au jour le jour. Aujourd'hui, au Sénégal, nous sommes confrontés à des inondations qui sont assez importantes et qui touchent euh, presque tout le pays et qui certainement vont avoir des impacts sur euh, la nutrition dans nos pays. Euh, go back, please, go back, please. Euh, nous avons également de, beaucoup de, de problèmes politiques dans nos pays. Euh, vous êtes tous euh, au courant des coups d'État qui existent dans nos pays et qui entraînent dans certains cas des sanctions économiques pour un peu essayer de retrouver euh, la démocratie. Et malheureusement, ces sanctions économiques vont impacter fortement nos populations et surtout nos, nos enfants avec euh, une augmentation de la malnutrition, ce qui fait que donc, ça pose des problèmes particuliers. Nous sommes également confrontés à des guerres qui sont dans la sous-région, à des problèmes de djihadisme. Et tout cela fait que donc, nous, scientifiques, nous devons vraiment euh, avoir euh, une nouvelle approche par rapport à cela. Et nous devons également euh, faire un plaidoyer au sein de nos pays pour euh, améliorer un peu la, la recherche euh, dans notre pays. Alors, euh, si vous regardez au niveau du Sénégal, euh, nous avons beaucoup d'argent euh, qui est investi dans la malnutrition. Nous avons, euh, je regardé euh, notamment entre 2017 et 2021, nous avons environ 274 millions de dollars qui ont été euh, injectés dans la malnutrition dans le pays. Euh, malgré tout cela, euh, on a encore des chiffres qui sont assez élevés dans certaines zones. Et euh, si vous regardez un peu la part de la recherche, est presque nulle pour ne pas dire euh, qu'il n'y en a presque pas. Ce qui fait que donc, euh, nous n'avons pas, euh, nous, euh, l'impression, nous les chercheurs, d'apporter vraiment notre part à l'édifice dans la lutte contre, le, dans, contre la malnutrition. Et je vous donne comme exemple cette slide qui montre un peu euh, les efforts qui ont été faits pour certaines pathologies, dont le paludisme. Vous avez vu ici sur cette euh, euh, diapositive que dans les années 2000, la maladie était très importante en termes de prévalence et qu'actuellement, nous sommes à des niveaux de prévalence très faibles. Pourquoi Parce que tout simplement, les chercheurs euh, de nos pays, notamment du Sénégal, ont développé plusieurs stratégies euh, qui ont tenu compte du contexte local, qui ont tenu compte euh, de, 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 de la possibilité que nous avons au niveau de notre pays pour développer des stratégies pérennes et durables qui, euh, comme vous le voyez sur les flèches jaunes, ont entraîné au bout de quelques années euh, une diminution drastique de la maladie. Vous avez euh, une euh, stratégie qui a pris en compte euh, les populations, les communautés qui ont euh, été impliquées dans euh, la prise en charge de cette pathologie. C'est la pécadome que vous voyez. Et cette pécadome euh, a permis de réduire fortement euh, la maladie. Ce qui fait que donc, il est important que la même chose puisse être effectuée certainement pour euh, la, la maladie comme la malnutrition. Et ça permettrait un peu aux scientifiques que nous sommes de pouvoir euh, apporter leur part à l'édifice euh, dans la lutte contre la malnutrition dans, notre, dans, dans le contexte international. Diapositive, s'il vous plaît. Euh, C'est dans ce cadre-là que euh, nous prévoyons euh, vraiment de, de, de développer, vraiment euh, de, mettre en, de faire un plaidoyer au niveau de nos différents pays pour permettre vraiment euh, à nos chercheurs de pouvoir bénéficier de la part des bailleurs euh, de plus de, de considération, si je puis dire, hein, de plus euh, de moyens financiers qui, le, qui nous permettront, nous, de pouvoir analyser en tenant compte des, euh, de l'environnement dans lequel nous sommes, euh, de vraiment pouvoir apporter notre part à l'édifice. Et j'ai tout à l'heure entendu beaucoup de, de bailleurs de l'UNICEF, de, de l'OMS et tout, mais euh, personne n'a mis l'accent vraiment sur euh, la recherche. Et je prends l'exemple de notre hub ici qui actuellement développe ses stratégies de recherche au niveau des trois pays. Et c'est un peu, si je puis dire, euh, le financement le plus important que nous avons reçu dans le, dans le pays en termes de recherche sur la malnutrition. Alors que nous avons des scientifiques de haute, de, de haute renommée qui, sont, qui maîtrisent bien la malnutrition et qui sont capables de pouvoir apporter des solutions. Mais malheureusement, euh, la part que ces programmes de, de, de lutte donnent à la recherche sont vraiment minimes, pour ne pas dire euh, nuls. Et pour cela, donc, euh, nous devons impliquer les recherches et les chercheurs doivent s'impliquer davantage. Les pays doivent impliquer les chercheurs dans la mise en place des stratégies. Nous avons de très bonnes stratégies actuellement, des programmes de lutte contre la malnutrition qui existent dans tous nos pays. Mais si vous y allez euh, en profondeur, vous ne verrez pas les chercheurs à l'intérieur qui sont impliqués dedans. L'année dernière, nous avions invité le ministère de la Santé du Sénégal qui nous avait fait une très belle présentation, mais malheureusement, 
euh, nous n'avons pas senti vraiment euh, la part des chercheurs dans ce sens-là. Et nous devons vraiment euh, améliorer cela. Et pour cela, donc, les pays doivent s'approprier la recherche euh, comme ils l'ont fait pour certaines pathologies qui ont entraîné beaucoup de mortalité, comme le paludisme, comme le, le VIH, comme la tuberculose. Et donc, il faut apporter, donner plus de poids à la recherche pour permettre à ces chercheurs-là d'identifier des stratégies novatrices, des stratégies qui vont venir apporter une plus-value à ce qui est en train d'être fait pour améliorer encore la lutte contre la malnutrition dans nos pays. Mettre en place vraiment des, 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 des équipes multidisciplinaires avec des protocoles multidisciplinaires qui vont tenir compte de l'ensemble des euh, composantes qui impactent sur la malnutrition. Je donne un exemple. Aujourd'hui, euh, les sciences sociales qui jouent un rôle important sont minimisées plus ou moins dans euh, la, le financement de la recherche. Alors qu'il nous faut comprendre comment les populations appréhendent cette aide que nous leur apportons contre la malnutrition, comment ils comprennent cette malnutrition. Aujourd'hui, nous avons des populations assistées. Ils attendent qu'on leur donne, mais ils ne sont pas des personnes qui vont agir lutter contre la malnutrition. Et il nous faut comprendre comment ils euh, voient les choses, comment ils appréhendent les choses, et qu'ils ne soient pas des spectateurs et qu'ils soient plutôt des acteurs dans cela. Et ça, donc, euh, des stratégies de recherche et des chercheurs doivent vraiment euh, améliorer, ou en tout cas, doivent être supportés pour pouvoir euh, apporter tous ces, tous ces, tous ces éléments-là. Et donc, euh, également, donc, je pense que la mise en place de réseaux sub-régionaux donc, euh, permettrait également de partager des connaissances dans la sous-région, par exemple. Nous avons des situations particulières qui sont différentes en fonction des pays, qui sont même différentes à l'échelle même d'un même pays. Et euh, ceci permettrait de pouvoir améliorer un peu euh, tout ce que nous faisons dans la lutte contre la malnutrition et euh, donner une part importante aux chercheurs euh, qui jouent un rôle pour moi primordial et qui ont été à la base de tous les succès que nous avons eu dans les différentes pathologies euh, qui ont constitué euh, dans nos pays des problèmes de santé publique. Slide, s'il vous plaît. Nous avons illustré beaucoup de choses, mais une chose est importante, c'est la modélisation. Il nous faut prévoir ce qui va venir. Nous avons été brutalement impactés par la COVID. Nous sommes actuellement brutalisés par la guerre qui existe au, en Ukraine et qui certainement va avoir des répercussions au niveau de notre pays. Et nous le sentons même dans notre hub. Nous avons eu, Claire le sait très bien, donc une réduction qui a été due certainement au COVID, mais également aux conséquences liées à la guerre et aux autres facteurs. Et donc, les modélisations permettraient de pouvoir euh, prédire cela. Et donc, c'est un rôle qui est dédié aux scientifiques, aux chercheurs, qui doivent améliorer et aider les, les décideurs politiques à planifier euh, la prise en charge et la lutte contre la maladie euh, de la malnutrition que nous avons dans nos différents pays. Donc, il est important également que les chercheurs puissent être indépendants et qu'ils puissent apporter vraiment euh, leur part à l'édifice, euh, tenant compte, bien sûr, euh, des différentes euh, situations qui existent dans les pays que, dans lesquels nous, nous vivons. Et euh, vraiment, c'est un cri du cœur que je, je lance à l'endroit, slide s'il vous plaît, euh, à l'endroit des euh, bailleurs de fonds euh, qui sont aujourd'hui avec nous, euh, à l'endroit également des décideurs politiques pour qu'ils prennent davantage plus euh, en compte la part des chercheurs et qu'ils allouent plus encore de recherche. Et nous sommes convaincus que euh, la recherche pourra apporter euh, tous les, euh, comment dirais-je, les résultats que nous souhaitons avoir dans la lutte contre la malnutrition. C'est vraiment un plaidoyer que je fais et je terminé les passer mon advocacy for research. Je pense qu'il est important que nous tous, que nous soyons impliqués et que nous fassions, fassions euh, ce plaidoyer au sein des bailleurs, mais également au sein de nos euh, pays respectifs. Voilà en résumé ce que je voulais dire euh, concernant euh, cette journée. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Claire. Babakar, thank you so much for that. It was a really timely reminder of, you know, transformation, transitions. You know, you need everybody's voice at the table. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, we had a panel discussion scheduled, but we are so far out of time now. What I thought I would do was ask each of the panelists to come up with their closing statement. And it is a closing statement. The one thing they want the audience to take home from. So I thought we could do that very quickly um, and we can start 
with, I'm just going to go on the screen. We'll start with Bharati. Who's right, who's right on the left of the screen. So what's your, what's your one, what do you think Bharati? What's your one take home? Uh, hi, Claire. Uh, one take would be dietary diversity, inclusion of foods in diets uh, that are uh, rich in nutrients, including fresh fruits, vegetables, uh, milk, as well as other animal source foods during pregnancy in the first thousand days during pregnancy and you know, during infant. Thank you. Thank you, Varati. Uh, Patricia. Thank you. So um, a whole food systems approach is the only way to look at all factors affecting healthy diets. It is both a prioritization, a policy prioritization, and not only a responsibility of the consumer. Okay, thank you. Grania. Okay, we can go to Umi. Umi, can you give us your one line? Thank you, Claire. I think I would like to say that uh, just transition to food system requires the understanding of the local context at the community uh, up to the individual level. Okay, and our, and our um, in-person audience, so. A just transition requires addressing affordability. Nutrient-dense foods are expensive. Uh, we need to be uh, a little bit more clear-eyed about the alternative ways of achieving affordability. None of them are great, but we may need to embrace them. Great, thank you. Anish. Yeah, you can. Yeah. So uh, with the such a great collaboration with uh, reputed organizations globally, we should try and develop uh, at least one strategy which can be uh, sustainable, replicable, cost-effective so that the government can adopt and uh, uh, act on it and scale it up to the national level, like in countries like India, Indonesia, and other countries, so that we can win over this uh, stunting issue. So that's what I would, uh, expect in the future. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Kamal, do you want to? Or are you okay? uh, yeah, I would say that it's contextual problems are contextual solution also. So mm -hmm. try and find out something which is easy, affordable, and integratable. Great, thank you. Babakar. Travayum awesome working together with uh, all the scientists uh, in all the countries to fight. <laughs> our countries. All right, thanks very much. I think we've captured everybody that's on. Yeah. All right, great. So um, please um, come to lunch in the foyer downstairs. Um, come join us and you can see an exhibition uh, by Liz Hinckley, who's sitting there on uh, some of her work in India. And also as Rachel noticed, uh, Rachel mentioned, um, you can see the public engagement material and finally, I'd like to thank the team who put this together and our country teams for all their hard work. So from Eleanor, thank you very much for that beautiful, uh, it was fascinating watching you. Vasiliki for all your hard work. Dinesh, the same. We've got a whole group, a team. Um, Shireen, thank you. Goon is here somewhere, thank you. And uh, I think, I hope I've captured everybody. Dylan and Alessia, who's probably, uh, you know, did a lot of work early on, and Chelsea, who aren't with us today because they're not feeling well. All right, thank you, everybody, and thank the audience for coming in. We hope to see you downstairs. You're interested in animal source foods. How great is that? Realizing <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, 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 yeah, we'll start doing that. Right. So, I time to feed the soul, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you know the second part. I don't think that's taking much for the second part. It's, it's okay. I can really use whatever is there. Yeah, yeah. Room. Maybe outside. Yeah, the lunch place should be there. Yeah. Thank you for the good work. Thank you. Everything is good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everything will be all right. Yes, we'll put them all on. That's okay. Okay. <laughs>